Hello! Uh, welcome back once again to another one of our videos covering the principles of microeconomics. Uh, once again, if you are not in my class, then might I suggest picking up a copy of my textbook, A Step-by-Step -step Guide to the Principles of Microeconomics, uh, which of course will help you solve all the sorts of problems that you will see in your own Principles of Micro course. Uh, especially problems perhaps about elasticity, which is what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, which is sort of what we've come up to at this point, right? So, so far we've covered the supply and demand models, of course, uh, and we've covered them extensively. We've gone over some of the things that go into demand. We've gone over some of the things that go into supply, especially, you know, the underlying decisions that go into what happens to a demand curve, right? What are all the individual decisions that make up each little point on a demand curve? Similarly, what are all the little decisions and all the profit maximizing uh, cho production choices that go into the competitive supply curve? All right, so we've gotten that far. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to be going back a little bit to our, our overarching uh, supply and demand model, the one that you know describes the whole market all at once rather than an individual consumer or an individual producer. And we're going to be moving it around a little bit. And, and we're going to be seeing what we can do to, to get a little bit of a better idea of how we can describe markets a little bit better uh, and how we can maybe describe markets more flexibly. Because right? so far all that we've done, we've drawn our supply and demand curves pretty much the same way every time. And that suggests that all markets are the same, which of course they are not. So we need to have some way of describing how certain markets are different and see if we can get any good mileage out of that. And we're gonna do that with elasticity, which is what we're gonna cover today. So before we really get into elasticity, I wanna share a fact with you. And this fact comes in the form of a graph. And this graph uh, is the high school uh, to college wage premium. So basically it's the uh, ratio of the average college educated worker to uh, the earnings, sorry, the, it's the ratio of the earnings by the average educated, college educated worker to the average uh, high school educated worker. Right? So you're probably familiar, people with, high, with college degrees tend to earn more money than people uh, without them. But how much more? Well, that, that value can change over time. And so if we see at this in this particular graph, you can see that uh, as of 1973, uh, the ratio, uh, the, the earnings premium for college educated workers was about 38% uh, for women, about 25% for men. As we went into the late 70s, both of those dropped, right? We saw that the ratio of college educated workers to uh, high school educated workers in terms of their earnings dropped. So they still earned more, but not as much more. So it drops down to about 28% uh, for women, about 20% for men. However, as we continue to go on through time from the late 70s up through the 80s and the 90s and then up to the 2000s, it rebounds. So we had this drop and then it rebounded back again. Uh, and as we sit today, uh, the average college educated worker earns about 50% more uh, than the average high school educated worker, which is not a small amount. So, you know, good on you. So let's keep that in mind. I'm not going to explain what's going on quite yet, but, but we're going to come back to it. So shoving that away for a second, let's think about this question instead. So let's imagine that you've decided to get yourself a nice television uh, for your dorm room or apartment. Uh, you go online to find what the best price is, and, and one of two things happens. Uh, let's say that in one scenario, you go online to find the best price, and it turns out that the best price for the kind of television you're interested in is $300. Okay? Uh, now I want you to think, okay, well, are you going to be willing to buy that television at $300? Just think about it. Are you going to be willing to do it? Now imagine a different scenario. You go online and you look for, uh, for the lowest price and it turns out that the lowest price for the TV you're interested in is $600. Not $300, $600. Now, you know, this is not a, a waiting game. You're not going to be able to just wait around and, and look harder for a better price and find the $300. No, it's actually just $600. So would you still buy the television? Now, probably uh, a lot of you sitting out there uh, decided that you would buy the TV at $300, but not at $600, right? We lost a lot of the quantity demanded when we went from $300 to $600, right? Nothing too surprising there. Right? We're just following the law of demand. The price goes up, the quantity demanded goes down, demand slopes downwards. Everything so far is perfectly fine. Now, let's consider a different scenario. Let's say uh, that your family uh, is uh, not going to have uh, hol the holidays this year anywhere near you. Uh, instead, you're going to have to get a plane ticket if you want to join your family for the holidays. Now, whether or not being with your family for the holidays sounds like a lot of fun, your mom will be very angry at you if you don't go. So, you go online, you try to figure out how, how cheap the cheapest plane ticket to wherever the holidays are being held this year, and it turns out that it's $300. Okay, well, are you going to buy that ticket or not? Think about it. Okay, are you going to buy it for $300? Uh, 
Okay, now let's imagine a different scenario. Uh, same scenario with, with the holidays being held somewhere else. You go online to find the cheapest price, and it turns out that the cheapest price is $600. And do you buy that ticket? Well, probably, oh, uh, some of you at home bought it at $300, but not at $600, but most of you probably bought it at both. So let's think about what this is going on here, how we compare these two scenarios, the scenario of the television and the scenario of buying the plane ticket to go see your family at the holidays. Now, in both of these cases, the price doubled, right? And in fact, it changed by the same amount, right? We went from $300 doubling to $600. But probably a lot more people decided to stop buying the good when it was the TV than when it was the plane ticket. So we have the same price change here, but the quantity demanded changed by different amounts in these two scenarios. So clearly there's something different going on with these two demand curves, the demand curve for televisions and the demand curve for plane tickets home for the holidays. So we need to be able to describe this difference somehow. How can we do it? We're going to be able to do that using the concept of elasticity. Elasticity is the way that we're going to describe how for the same price change on two different goods, one good is going to lose a lot of quantity demanded and the other is going to lose only a little bit. When we, say, when we see that there's a lot of quantity demanded being lost, we're going to say that that's very elastic, an elastic response there, right? Uh, and if we see very little change, we're going to call that inelastic. You can sort of imagine this like a pair of pants. If you have a pair of pants and you pull on the waistband of those pants, uh, if the waistband is made of elastic, it will move a lot. If you change the price, the quantity demanded moves a lot. But if the waistband is not made of elastic, you can pull, but you're only going to get a little bit of movement out of those pants, right? They're going to stay more or less the same waist size that they always were, right? So an elast a, a elastic response means that there's going to be a large quantity demanded response whenever the price changes. But for the same price change, if the demand is inelastic, you're not going to see that much of a response, just like pants. Uh, and we can think about how else we can think about. So, so far I've given you the basic concept of elasticity, right? Price changes and for a given price change, a elastic response means that the quantity demanded is going to change a lot and an inelastic response means that the quantity demanded is going to change very little. All right. So, uh, we can also think about, well, where else do we see something that describes how the quantity demanded changes when the price changes? Well, that basically is the definition of a demand curve, right? We are describing the difference between two different demand curves, one where the quantity demanded will change a lot and one where the quantity demanded will change a little. And in fact, the concept of elasticity is sort of baked in to that demand curve, in particular in the slope of that demand curve. I can draw two different demand curves and we're going to be able to see that one of them represents a more elastic demand and the other one represents a more inelastic demand. Uh, so if I draw out two demand curves right next to each other, we got price up here, we got quantity down here, and this demand curve over here on the left I'm going to draw with a very shallow slope. Okay, That's demand, and over here on the right I'm going to draw a demand curve with a very steep slope. So just for a second, look at these and try to convince yourself uh, which one of them you think is likely to represent inelastic demand and which one is going to represent elastic demand. Just think about it, see if you can figure it out. So it turns out that the one that is a shallow slope, that one represents elastic demand. So how do we know? So let's imagine a price change. Let's put the same price change on both of these demand curves. We're going to go from P and we're going to shift upwards to P prime. Now we can follow those prices over and I'm going to put it on both of these demand curves so we can see that we have the same price change going on. Given those price changes, let's see what happens to change the quantity demanded. So over here on the shallow slope, we can see the quantity demanded goes from up here all the way down here from Q to Q prime. And over here on the right, we can see that quantity demanded goes from here to here, Q prime, a much smaller shift. Now this is exactly what we would expect. Think about it, right? If we have a shallow slope, that means that we need, if we move the, the y-axis only a little bit, we're going to move a whole lot on the x-axis, right? Small price change leads to a big quantity change. 
On the other hand, on our shallow slope, if we want to move around on the, on the x-axis, we need to move around on the y-axis a lot. So in order to get a, even a small quantity change, we need to move price around a whole lot, right? Quantity is going to stay more or less the same there on an inelastic demand uh, than it will on an, e, on an elastic demand. Keep having to say that really carefully because an elastic demand sounds a lot like inelastic demand, but we don't want to mix those two up. So let me label these here. We got inelastic over here on the right, and we got elastic over here on the left. And in particular, I'm going to call this uh, what's called relatively inelastic and relatively elastic. Okay? Uh, by relatively elastic and relatively inelastic, all we mean is that, you know, they're, they're compared to each other. They're relatively elastic or inelastic. One is more elastic than the other at any given price. Okay? And that's one way that we can represent elasticity. The more elastic demand is, the shallower its slope will be. And the more inelastic demand is, the steeper its slope is going to be. So we have this graphical idea of what elasticity is and what it looks like on a graph. Uh, but that doesn't tell us a whole lot if we don't know, well, what kinds of goods are likely to be on the left and what kinds of goods are likely to be on the right. Uh, after all, we did the TV and uh, plane ticket example, and we found out that probably uh, the TV is going to have a more elastic demand and the plane ticket is going to have a more inelastic demand. But how do we know that? How do we know that that's what we're going to get? So there's going to be four main things that are going to determine demand elasticity. Those things are the substitution possibilities, budget share, the frequency of purchase, and addiction and habituation. And I'm going to go through these one by one, but a basic theme is going to come up in them again and again. And this is a good way to think about demand elasticity, which is that the easier it is for you to decide to not buy something when the price goes up, the more elastic it's going to be, right? You can sort of think, how painful would it be for me to really stop buying this thing? And if it doesn't hurt too much, then when the price goes up, well, you just stop buying it. Uh, but if it's going to hurt, sting a whole lot, uh, then you're going to keep on buying. We can think about the TV and plane ticket example. You want a new dice TV, it's going to be nice for you. You don't really need it. So we would expect that one to be easy to stop buying if the price goes up, elastic. The plane ticket example, you don't want your mom to yell at you. So, you know, you're going to buy that thing no matter what it costs, uh, within reason. Uh, and so we would expect that to be an inelastic response. But let's go through these determinants one by one. So the first one we're going to look at is substitution possibilities. And basically, like I said, the easier it is to not buy something, the more likely it is you're going to not buy it when the price goes up, right? Easy to stop buying the thing. And one way that there's going to be, it's going to make that is going to make it easy to stop buying the thing is if there are a lot of very close substitutes to it. That is, if there are other goods that do basically the same thing as what you were going to buy. So in the TV's case, you know, if the TV's too expensive, you can always just watch Netflix on your laptop, right? There's a close substitute for what the TV is offering you. Uh, and so we would expect that to be elastic, right? You don't, you're not going to be completely out of luck uh, with whatever the TV's going to bring you. You can use some other good that is a close substitute to it. We can take this to the extreme and think about what's called a perfect substitute. A perfect substitute is where you literally do not care which of the two things you have. They're exactly the same to you. So one example of this might be uh, having a green tennis ball or a yellow tennis ball. All right. Imagine you go to the store, you're, you like tennis, and you're thinking about buying some tennis balls. And you see on the shelf there's some green tennis balls and there's some yellow tennis balls, and you don't really care which one of them you have. So if the price of them is exactly the same, then you don't care. You're willing to buy either of them. But imagine that the price of yellow tennis balls went up by even a penny. Well, now you have two goods, you value them exactly the same, and one of them is more expensive. You're never going to buy that one. You're always going to buy the cheaper one. So in that case, we change the price only a tiny little bit. We only increase the price by one penny. And you went from buying whatever you were going to buy to zero. That's a very big quantity demanded change in response to a very small price change. In other words, elastic response. So when we have very close substitutes, when it's very easy to just get something else that does the same thing, you're going to have an elastic response. So that's one thing that's going to determine elasticity. We can also think about the, uh, the opposite side of this. Instead of something with a lot of substitutes, we can think about something with no substitutes, like food. Right? Food, just as a general thing, you need to eat more or less the same amount of it every day, uh, no matter what the price is. If, if food got really expensive and you had to spend your whole paycheck just buying food, 
you'd still have to do it, right? You wouldn't really have any alternatives. You can't just not have food. So in that case, we would expect food to be, have a very inelastic response. Now you might notice, well, that's kind of strange because I can imagine a lot of foods that it'd be very easy for me to go without. And this brings us to another thing that, well, one of the things that determines elasticity is how narrowly we define the market, right? Food is a very general item. There's not really any substitutes for food. But there are plenty of substitutes for specific kinds of foods, right? Food is very inelastic. There's no, there's no substitutes for it. But chocolate chip cookies, those are going to be very elastic because if the price of chocolate chip cookies goes up, you can just buy another kind of cookie. Really easy. So the more specific a market gets, the more elastic the response is going to be. The more general a market is, the more inelastic a response is going to be, right? Price of food goes up, you're going to buy the same amount of food. Price of chocolate chip cookies goes up, you buy sugar cookies instead. Super easy. Next, budget share. Uh, now, remember, you are a consumer, right? And as a consumer, you only have so much money that you can actually spend. So when you go to the store, if something, you know, if, if the price of something goes up, you might need to buy a little bit less of it, right? And in particular, imagine it's something for which you already spend a whole lot of money on it. Now imagine that there was a percentage increase in the price of something that you already spend a lot of money on. Now, you probably don't have a lot of extra wiggle room to spend that much more on the thing. So if you already spend a whole lot of money on something and it gets more expensive, you got to find some other way to do things because you simply can't afford to buy any more of that, to pay any more money for that thing. So one example of this is rent. Imagine that you're spending a third of your income on rent and it goes up to 50%. Now you, might, you just might not be able to handle that. You would have to find some alternative. You might have to move back in with your parents or find a cheaper apartment or something, right? As opposed to, imagine you're you know, buying a candy bar and it costs you a dollar and it has the same increase, right? Let's say that uh, it, went, it uh, doubled in price, which would be even a larger increase uh, percentage-wise than going from 33% of your income to 50%. So even, even larger increase doubling but it's a lot easier to handle that. You can absorb that. The price of a candy bar goes up from $1 to $2. You can still buy as many candy bars as you want, really. So in that case, the, the, more, uh, the bigger chunk of your income a good takes up, the harder it is to keep up if the price goes up. So you're going to have to scale back. You just don't have any other option. Uh, and so the bigger a chunk of your income a good takes up, the more elastic it will be. The smaller a chunk of your income it takes up, the more inelastic it will be. Third up, we have frequency of purchase uh, or time. Basically, how long do you have to respond to a, to a price change? Now, this one has a little bit more to do with how we could observe uh, quantity, quantity demanded changing in the market. So it doesn't necessarily have to do with the desirability of the good, but it has more to do with when we would observe some sort of change. We see the price go up and, you know, maybe things don't change right away. And maybe it's going to take a little, bit while, a little while for us to notice that any quantity change has happened. Uh, it's not going to be an overnight change, perhaps, like we saw with Netflix, where they, changed, they increased the price and they lost millions of subscribers immediately. Instead, let's say you have something that you buy very rarely. So the price of something that you buy very rarely goes up. You're, you might change your behavior and buy less of it, but we're not going to notice that you're changing your behavior to, for a long time. Like imagine cars. You only buy a car, what, every five years? Uh, maybe if you're really wealthy and you really like cars, you buy a car every year. Now, imagine the price of cars goes up and you decide, well, you know, maybe I'll hold on to my old car for a couple more years. Now, that's a change in your behavior, but we're not going to notice that you've changed your behavior until you, we get to the point where you would have bought a car anyway. It's going to take us five years to notice that you have changed your behavior. And so the less frequently you buy something, the longer it's going to take for us to notice that any sort of change has happened. And so the more inelastic a response is going to be. Compare this to something like coffee. Imagine that you uh, went to Starbucks and you found out that the, your, the price of your favorite drink had doubled. You'd probably start buying it a lot less. And if you were already buying it every day, we would notice immediately that you had started buying it a lot less because you know you wouldn't come in tomorrow to buy your normal drink. We would see that go away as too, uh, go away as well. Uh, additionally, it just takes time for people to adjust to change. So some adjustments are going to be quicker than others. Uh, and in general, the longer you, of a time frame you give people to respond, the more elastic their response is going to be. Uh, because of this, we can think of most goods as being, having more elastic responses 
in the long run, when you give people a long time to respond to changes. So one example of this is in the 1970s when the price of gas went up, price of oil. Uh, there was a consortium of countries, the OPEC countries, and they controlled a large portion of the uh, gasoline market. They control a little bit smaller chunk of it today. Uh, but uh, in the 70s, they decided, you know what, we're going to get together and we're going to decide to raise the price of gasoline. They, of course, were not price takers, as we would see in our competitive market model. So they could raise the price whenever they wanted. Now, they raised the price and they were able to do this. And now price of gas goes up and you're going to have to respond. Okay. But it's going to take some time for you to figure out how to respond. You know the price of gas has gone up. You want to buy less gas because it's more expensive now. You want to follow the law of demand. But for the time being, you still have to drive to work, right? Uh, so you, maybe you want to move somewhere closer to work so you can walk. Well, that's going to take some time for you to find that new apartment. Maybe you want a, a car that doesn't burn as much gas. Fine, okay, but you got to wait until you have time to buy a new car and wait until it's you know something that you can afford. Uh, maybe you want to take the bus more often. Well, it's going to take you time to figure out how the bus schedule works and actually adjust your behavior. So we would see the change and the response to that behavior, to that price change, but it would take us some time. And in general, the longer of a time you give people to respond, the more responding they're going to do. You know, when you show up to Starbucks and the price of your drink is doubled, you're already at Starbucks. You might buy your drink anyway. Uh, you know, and so we, and so on the day that it changes, we might see no response whatsoever. But the next day, that's when we'd see the, the, behavior, the change in behavior when people decide to not come back and get their normal drink. So the more time you give people to respond, the more responding they will do, and the more elastic their response is going to be. Next, we have addiction and habituation. This one's fun. So we talked about the idea that the closer of a, a substitute you can find for a good, the more elastic the response is going to be, because it's very easy to stop buying that thing. However, some things have substitutes, but then they lose their substitutes because we get to like this particular version a whole lot. Uh, so one obvious example of this is drugs. Uh, if you are addicted to a drug, uh, you don't really consider there to be a lot of substitutes for that drug. You're willing to do a whole lot in order to pay the price of that drug, no matter how high it is. So you can imagine this, you know, if you are addicted to, say, heroin and the price of heroin doubles, well, you're going to find a way to pay for it. You're going to buy a similar amount of heroin to what you did before. Uh, and so a large price change leading to a small quantity demanded change is an inelastic response. We can scale this back and think about it in a more innocuous way uh, if we think about habituation. So, for example, take a newspaper. Uh, imagine that you are not currently subscribing to any newspaper, but you're thinking about doing one, uh, about getting a subscription. So you might think, okay, well, all these newspapers, they're pretty much the same. I could get the LA Times, I could get the New York Times, uh, I could get the Washington Post, whatever, I don't really care. They're all the same. But then you pick one, let's say you pick the New York Times, and then you start reading it every day, and you get used to it, and you get used to the columnists that they have, and you get used to the way that they write, and you get used to the crossword puzzle. Uh, and slowly, as you get more used to this particular version of it, those other things, which you used to consider to be perfect substitutes, no longer feel like perfect substitutes. I subscribe to the New York Times, and if they raise the price on me, well, they'd have to raise the price a lot to get me to switch, because I'm just used to what I already get. Uh, and so even though before I subscribed, I would have considered it equal to the Washington Post, now I consider it better than the Washington Post just because I'm used to it, right? And so, you know, they could raise the price and not lose as many subscribers because those subscribers are used to it, because they are habituated. And so that's going to make the response more inelastic once people get used to what, they're, what they have. So let's take this. Uh, and let's think about, you know, I want you to think about what we might expect demand elasticity to be for some different goods. Uh, and by the way, you know, we want to think, when we look at a good and we want to think, is demand going to be more inelastic or elastic for this? Is it going to be relatively elastic or relatively inelastic? You want to think about these four different determinants that we talked about before. Uh, now, some of them might contradict each other, but so in general, whether you think something is going to be elastic or inelastic, it's going to come down to a bit of a judgment call. Uh, and if we want to measure what it actually is going to be, we would need some data. But it's still good exercise to think about what it's likely to be. Uh, so let's take one of these examples. Let's take hand soap as an example. And let's think about how each of these four determinants could apply to hand soap. Think about hand soap. And so let's think about these four determinants. So first of all, do we think that hand soap has a lot of close substitutes? Okay, well, let's think about hand soap. Uh, well, it does have some, a pretty close substitute in uh, hand sanitizer. 
Maybe it didn't used to have the substitute, but now we have hand sanitizer. If, you, if the price of hand soap went up super high, you could substitute a lot of your hand soap use with hand sanitizer. So I would say yes. Yes, it has a close substitute. And okay, is the fact that it has close substitutes going to make the demand for it more elastic or less elastic? Okay, well, we have a close substitute, which suggests that it's going to be easy to stop buying the hand soap. So that's going to make it more elastic. Okay, what next? Budget share. Okay, does hand soap take up a huge portion of your budget or a tiny one? Probably a pretty small one. I mean, unless you really like to wash your hands. So I'm going to say that's going to be a small portion of your budget. And is that going to lead to a high, more, higher elasticity, to a more elastic demand or to less? Well, if it's a small portion of your budget, then it's going to be easy for you to keep buying it, to keep affording it if the price goes up. So that's going to make it more inelastic. All right, already we have some contradictory evidence here. Uh, next up, we have frequency of purchase. Okay, how often do you buy hand soap? Probably not very often. Like a bottle will last you a couple months, right? I mean, depending on how big of a bottle you get. Uh, so I would say you don't buy it very frequently. And that means that if the price changed, it would take a long time to notice that there was a change. So I would say that would probably be an uh, infrequent purchase, which would make it more inelastic. We can also think about time, but that just has to do more with how long we wait for you to have a response, right? Are we saying, okay, what's the response of a price change in hand soap tomorrow? Or what's the response of a price change in hand soap three months from now? And the three months from now is always gonna be more elastic than tomorrow, no matter what the good is, right? Because the more time you give people to respond, the more responding they can do. Lastly, uh, let's think about addiction and habituation. Do you get habituated to hand soap? Well. Probably not. I mean, the more you get used to hand soap, you probably don't consider hand sanitizer to be less of a substitute than you did before. So I'm going to say probably not habituated. Uh, so if we are not habituated to it, is that going to make it more elastic or less elastic? That's probably going to make it more elastic, right? Because it means that those substitutes that you have continue to be substitutes. So we have contradictory evidence here. Some of these factors say that it's going to be more elastic. Some of them say that it's going to be less. Generally, if you want to make a judgment call, probably the most important one to look at is this first one right here. Are there close substitutes? Uh, and, you know, if, uh, if you're not certain, I would say probably go with that one. Think, does this good have a lot of close substitutes? Very close. And the more important thing, there is not a lot of substitutes. It's a lot of close substitutes. Things that you really consider to be just about the same or uh, doing whatever it is that this good does. So I would guess, probably, that hand soap is going to be a good that has an elastic demand because it has that close substitute of hand sanitizer. Now, before hand sanitizer existed, are there a lot of close substitutes for hand soap? Not really. I would probably suspect that when the introduction of hand sanitizer was a thing, when they introduced hand sanitizer, the elasticity for hand soap probably got more elastic, would be my guess. Next, we have the concept of supply elasticity. You didn't think we were going to leave the supply side out there, did you? So supply elasticity has a lot of the same ideas going for it, right? We're looking at how much does quantity supplied change in response to a change in the price. Same idea as with demand elasticity, right? We see a change in the price and we know that quantity supplied is going to change, but how much is it going to change? Is it going to change really fast, a very elastic supply, or is it going to change very slowly, very little? That would be an inelastic supply. Uh, and we can think about e e the inelasticity of supply in, the s in similar graphical ways to what we can with demand. If I draw out two different supply curves, just like I did with the demand curves, uh, we're going to see that yet again, the one with the shallow slope is going to be a lot more elastic than the one with the very steep slope. If I put the same price change in for both of these, I go from P up to P prime, and I follow that over. I can see what, how quantity supplied is going to change. And here on the left, it goes from Q to QS, or Q prime, sorry. And that's going to be a lot bigger of a change than we get over here on the right. And so we have relatively elastic over here on the left, and relatively 
inelastic over here on the right. So for both demand and supply, shallow means it's elastic and steep means that it is inelastic. And if you, all, if you forget this, you can just work out this same practice, um, uh, approach that we did here. Just think about, given this slope, if we see a price change, is the quantity going to change a lot or a little? Okay? So, we have the same graphical idea of supply elasticity, and we want to think, well, what kinds of goods are going to be on the left and what kinds of goods are going to be on the right? And there are three main inputs to supply elasticity. And similar to demand elasticity, a lot of the important thing here is how easy is it to stop or start making this good if the price goes up, right? If the price of this thing goes up, you're going to want to start making it instead of whatever you were doing before. And so the easier it is to do that, the more elastic supply is going to be. So the three uh, determinants of supply elasticity we're going to look at are flexibility of inputs, the availability of substitute inputs, and of course, time. Uh, so first, uh, the ability of, to supply a certain amount of the good depends strongly on the production process and the inputs necessary to make the good. And the more flexible that production process is, the more elastic supply is going to be. So first, let's look at the flexibility of inputs. So let's imagine that you have some inputs, and those inputs could be used for a number of different goods, right? You can imagine plastic or metal or wood being used to make all sorts of different stuff. Uh, or something else that's very flexible, labor. You hire somebody, you could hire them to build a table, you could hire them to go do some sales for you. You could take people and you can use them to do a whole lot of very flexible different things. Although some people are more specialized than others. You couldn't take a bunch of doctors and tell them to go fix your car. So there's flexibility, or there, and there's more or less flexibility depending on what it is that you are using as inputs. Some things are more flexible, some things are less. So imagine the price of something goes up and it uses very flexible inputs. Well, if it uses very flexible inputs, that means that you might have some of those inputs around doing something else at the moment. If the price of wooden tables goes up, you happen to have a lot of wood sitting around currently being used to make chairs, you're like, ah, I really wanna sell some tables. Those are really expensive right now. I'm gonna stop making these chairs, make some tables instead which means that you're gonna respond more quickly and more thoroughly to a price change in tables because, of it, because it in, its inputs are very elastic. And that will give you an elastic supply for tables. Uh, now another thing is uh, the availability of substitute inputs. So the, availability, the flexibility of inputs was using the same input to make multiple different kinds of goods. This is making the same good with multiple different kinds of inputs. Some goods can be made in multiple different ways. Others cannot. They can only be made with particular inputs and you can't make them any other way. Uh, and as you might expect, the more flexible the production process is, the more elastic supply is going to be. Uh, so let's take tables again as an example. If the price of, of uh, tables goes way up, uh, and, and you could stop making wooden tables because you're running out of cheap wood and you need to start buying more expensive wood, but you're like, well, the price of tables is going up. I don't really want to have to buy this expensive wood. Well, heck, I'll just make tables out of plastic instead, right? There are multiple different ways to make tables, which is going to make the supply curve for tables more elastic. Other things, there's only one way to make. So, for example, land in downtown New York. There's only one way to sell land in downtown New York, and that's to get and have some land in downtown New York to sell. There's only one way to make it. And so the supply of land in downtown New York is going to be very inelastic. If the price of land in downtown New York goes up, you're like, well, shoot, the price has gone up. I really want to sell some of this. Too bad. You, there's no other way to make it. And all the land, you don't have any land in downtown New York. You can't enter the market uh, in order to sell it. Unless, of course, you already have some, in which case, go ahead. Uh, and so the, the supply for, demand in, for land in downtown New York would be very inelastic. You can also imagine some things that, you know, there are un they're unique. So there are the original Mona Lisa, there's only one of those. If you want to sell an original Mona Lisa, you have to buy the one original Mona Lisa, right? Uh, and so the supply of the original Mona Lisa is very inelastic because there's no other way to take inputs and make another one. That's an extreme example, uh, but there are, you know, some things are more flexible and some things are less. And the more flexible it is, the more different ways you can make it, the more elastic supply is going to be. Finally, we come to time as a determinant of supply elasticity. This one is very similar to the way that we thought about it on the demand side. Uh, the longer that you have to respond, the more elastic the response is going to be. And this one is even more important on the supply side than it is on the demand side. 
because remember, we're talking about supply here. And these are some big production processes. You might own a factory. Uh, you might have your business practices set up. You might have you know, your accountant and your lawyer who know how to work in the industry that you know how to work in. And so there's only so, so much flexibility that you can have right now, but you might be able to change your ways in the long run. So let's say you have that chair factory and you see that the price of tables goes up. Well, there's only so much that you can do like now because well, all your machines are set up to make chairs. All your workers know how to make chairs. All the wood that you're getting is specially designed for chairs. All the screws and schematics and, and designs you have are for chairs. And you know, I really should be making some tables. And you're going to do that. You're going to make that switch. But it's going to take you a little bit of time. You're going to have to take some time to retrain your employees, to get new machines in, to make sure that the wood you're getting is right for tables, to design the right kind of table. So you would have that elastic response, but it might take you a while to do which means that the longer we wait, the more elastic the response is gonna be. Similarly, if the price of something goes up and there's some people who aren't anywhere in the industry, but they might wanna take, they might wanna get in on it. It'll take them some time to realize that there's an opportunity to be had, and then move into wherever it is, and then take advantage of the opportunity. So again, the longer we wait, the more elastic the response is gonna be. So let's take an example of a certain form of supply and let's talk about baked goods. So what I have here is a picture of some baked goods and in particular I have a picture of some day old bagels. You might have noticed uh, the other places that you've been might have this same sort of thing where they offer some day old bagels uh, or other sorts of baked goods at a reduced price. So here's a question. Why? Why do we have these day old bagels? Uh, and the obvious answer for that is that they have some bagels left over from the day before uh, and you know they're going to offer them to you for a lower price because they're not as good as they were yesterday. But you know if, if the world were perfect there wouldn't be any day-old bagels because well they would have bought the exact number of bagels that they needed to sell them all. Right? They don't want to buy those extra bagels so they can sell to you at a discounted price. They would rather sell them to you at a whole price. right? Uh, you know, they don't want you coming in and buying the cheap bagel when you could be buying an expensive one instead. So why do they do it? Well, they can't predict exactly how many bagels they're going to need on a given day. So imagine that you are a coffee shop and you sell some baked goods and you buy them from a nearby bakery. Okay? Uh, and let's say that you know that every single day, uh, one dozen customers will come in and buy a bagel from you. And so every single day you get 12 bagels. Okay? Now, Let's imagine that something happens. Let's say that the office down the street closes down. Everyone goes home for the day and all your 12 customers and a lot of your 12 customers don't come in for the day. And so that day you only sell seven bagels. Now, what we see there is that the price is basically going down, right? Demand is shifting uh, to the left, which is going to drop the equilibrium price for those bagels. Uh, now, what we know is that when the price shifts to the, when the price drops, you're going to want to start supplying fewer bagels. But you know, this change only happened today, right? The office only shut down today. And so, uh, you know, you might be planning to make that change, but today you've already bought all 12 bagels. And so you're going to have a little bit left over. So what that means is that you're going to respond, right? Tomorrow, if you know that that demand is still going to stay low, you're going to stop buying 12 bagels and you're only going to start buying five or seven or however many that new amount is that you need to sell. Uh, but for the moment, Right? It's going to take you some time to respond. And so you're, right now, you've still bought the 12 bagels and you're still offering 12 bagels to sell. Your response is completely inelastic today. Tomorrow, you're going to respond. So your, res your response will be elastic. So the longer we wait, the longer we time we give you to respond, the more elastic your response is going to be. So we've gone over the determinants of elasticity. Uh, we've also talked about how elasticity plays into our supply and demand curves and how the slope of the supply and demand curves describes the, elast the relative elasticity of those goods, both on the supply and demand side. But we can also calculate out what elasticity is. So we're going to write this out. The formula for elasticity is that price elasticity is equal to the percent change in quantity divided by the percent change in price. That's the definition of price elasticity. Right? Everything's in terms of percentages, you'll note. Uh, and what we're basically asking here is when price changes, how much does quantity change? And that could be a positive change if you're, if you're talking about an increase in price uh, and uh, we then see an increase in quantity for uh, supply. 
Uh, or it could be they go in the opposite directions where if the price goes up for demand, we'd see the quantity demanded drop. Uh, and now you can imagine, you know, instinctively, we want something that elasticity is going to measure to be to say that, well, if the quantity response is very large, then we say that it's elastic. And if the quantity response is very small, we say that it's inelastic. So if this number is very large, that means that the percentage change in quantity is very large relative to the percentage change in price, elastic. And if this number is very small, we see that the percentage change in quantity is very small relative to the percentage change in price, inelastic. So it does what we want. Let's take this and then let's uh, put it into some slightly different formats. We're going to write out the formula for, per, for uh, percentage changes and see what we can do with it. So the percentage change in quantity is the change in quantity. I'm going to write that as a delta Q. That little triangle is a delta, the Greek letter delta, and it means change, uh, divided by Q. That's how you would calculate a percentage change in quantity. That's divided by the percentage change in price, which is delta P over P. We can rearrange this to get that the price elasticity is delta Q over delta P times P over Q. Now, a handy thing here, delta Q over delta P, well, that is the rise over run. If we had the Q on the, on the Y axis and the P on the X axis, we have the other way around. And so we can turn this into one over the slope of our curve. Whether we're talking about the demand curve or the supply curve, whatever the slope on quantity is, that is going to be here. We're going to take 1 divided by the slope of that curve, multiplied by price divided by quantity. Uh, you'll notice here, uh, first of all, that you know, this is 1 divided by the slope of the curve. That slope of the curve is going to stay the same for the demand curves we're going to be working with. But the price and quantity, that's going to change, which means that the elasticity that we calculate is actually going to be different depending on what point on the curve we are at. It could be that at some points on the curve, it's inelastic, and on some points on the curve, it's inelastic. Uh, even though we have relative elasticity, right, which is, gives us a, a general idea of what elasticity is like based on the slope itself. Uh, now, when, when I say that we might have it elastic at some points and inelastic at others, well, what do I actually mean? We're calculating out a number. What numbers are inelastic? What numbers are elastic? What we're going to say is that if this number right here is above 1, that is an elastic. Good. Uh, and if it is uh, below one, it is inelastic. Uh, now, uh, specifically, uh, we are talking about positive numbers here. This uh, elasticity could also be negative. And if it's negative, it's the same idea. If it's more negative than negative 1, then it's going to be elastic. And if it's less negative than negative 1, it's going to be inelastic. Basically, how is it, if it's really close to 0, meaning if it's really close to being a 0 change, that's inelastic. If it's outside the bounds of negative 1 and 1, then that, that is elastic. That might, it might help if I draw a little number line here, uh, where I draw a number line. I got 0 in the middle. I have negative 1 over here, and I have positive 1 over here on the right. I'm going to say that this area in here from negative 1 to 1, that is inelastic. And then outside of those bounds, if it's more positive than 1, that is elastic. And if it is less negative than negative 1, that is also elastic. You might be wondering what it is if it's exactly 1. Well, we're not going to worry about that in my class. If you're in somebody else's class, that is called unit elastic. But again, my class, don't worry about it. So we have this basic approach for calculating out an actual number for elasticity. So let's take some practice with this. Let's do an example. So let's use a demand curve where price is equal to 100 minus 2QD. Okay? We want to find a price elasticity at some different quantities. Remember, the elasticity is going to be different depending on what our P and Q are. So as we change that around, we're going to get different numbers for the same demand curve. Okay? So uh, let's figure this out. So we know that our, our equation is going to be 1 divided by the slope times price divided by quantity. We have our quantities, so we know that, for example, QD is going to be 25 when we start out. We know our slope. Our slope is negative 2. Right, that's the thing that I'm multiplying QD by. Well, what's our price? Well, to get the price, we just have to plug in our quantity. So we get that the price is 100 minus 2 times 25, which is 100 minus 50, or 50. So then I can plug these things in. Our elasticity 
at a quantity of 25 is 1 over negative 2 times our price of 50 divided by our quantity of 25, uh, which is going to be 50, divi 50 divided by negative 50 or negative 1. Okay? Uh, now, by the way, again, uh, if you've read some text, some textbooks will claim that you always want to report elasticity as a positive number, even if you get a negative calculation. Uh, now, you should ask, if you are not in my class, ask your professor which one of those they want. Uh, if you are in my class, I don't really care. You can report it as positive or negative, and it's fine by me either way. Uh, so I'm not going to take points off for you for that. I prefer to write demand elasticities as a negative number. Uh, so that's, that's one of the examples. Let's, let's work at another quantity. Let's see how different it is if we have a quantity of 40. Okay. So the slope is still going to be negative 2. Uh, this time our price is going to be 100 minus 2 times 40. It's going to be 100 minus 80 or 20. So then our elasticity is going to be 1 over negative 2 times our price of 20 divided by our quantity of 40, which is going to be uh, 20 over negative 80 or negative 1 fourth. So by just looking at different quantities, we manage to get different elasticity calculations. Uh, that demand curve in the middle, I will leave for you to do on your own if you want another example. But um, let's, uh, let's do a supply elasticity as well. It's the exact same procedure. Uh, and so we are going to, again, look at 1 over the slope times price over quantity. Uh, we know that our quantity, QS, is 10. We know that our slope, uh, if we have a, uh, a supply curve of 10 plus 2QS, our slope is going to be 2 here. And our price is going to be 10 plus 2 times our quantity, which is 10. Uh, so that's 10 plus 20, or 30. If I plug everything in, that gives me 1 over 2 times our price of 30, divided by our quantity of 10, which is going to give me 3 halves. Now, let's think about this. Uh, this number is above 1. So this is an elastic response. What about those other ones that we had before? we go back to them. All right. Uh, this one was negative 1. That was, of course, unit elastic. We're not going to worry about that one too much. This one is negative 1 fourth. So that is between the bounds of negative 1 and 1, right? If we draw out our number line, we got 0, negative 1, and 1, right? We got negative 1 fourth is right here, and that is inelastic, right? Because it's between negative 1 and 1. Okay, so we've gotten elasticity. We've determined what causes things to be elastic or inelastic. We've shown it on the graph, and we've calculated out the point elasticity, the number that we get uh, for elasticity at a given price and quantity. Let's see what else we can do. Uh, well, a lot of the interesting things we can do with elasticity are going to come when we start applying it to actual markets. So let's do some of that. So let's talk about Vietnam, the Vietnam War and college-educated workers. Uh, and so it's well known, like the people who have a bachelor's degree earn significantly more than people who don't. And an interesting thing about the Vietnam War is that when soldiers came home, they all got basically free college educations, or at least heavily subsidized. So after the soldiers came home, suddenly there were a whole lot more college-educated workers. And that brings us back to, I hope you didn't forget, this graph right here, where we had the wage premium for a college-educated worker start uh, in 1973 rather high, then it dipped and then it came back up and recovered. So how can we use elasticity to explain this particular phenomenon? So let's take ourselves back to 1973 at the very beginning of that graph. And now the demand for college-educated workers was pretty inelastic at the time. Right? There were not a lot of people who, who went to college or graduated from college. And so not a lot of industries had sprung up to use their labor, which meant that the demand for it was pretty inelastic. If the price changed, if the price of college-educated workers dropped, say, you know, you might want to hire some more people, but just not a lot of industries really had a need for college-educated workers, and so they wouldn't hire that many more people. Right? They already have all the people they want, pretty much. But let's think about what happens with elasticity. Well, what's one of the determinants of demand elasticity? Well, it's time. And so if we change the price of something, and then we give people a long time to respond, then we'll see a more elastic response. So 
uh, let's first let's take this first step. So if we so we let's we draw out our demand and supply curve, and we're going to shift supply to the right. Right, the supply is going to shift to the right uh, because the workers, the soldiers, all came home. They got college degrees that increased the number of workers uh, potential available to provide college educated labor, uh, which increases supply. Shift supply to the right, and as we said, demand is very inelastic. And so when we shift supply to the right, we're going to see a big change in the price and a relatively small change in the quantity. Now, did we see a big change in the price, a big drop in the price? Yes, we did. We saw that the college wage premium dropped. So people were not willing to pay as much for those college educated workers because there's just so many of them around. You don't got to pay them anything. They're, they're just crawling all over the place. But over time, things are going to get more elastic. Demand is going to get more elastic. So you have a lot of college educated workers just sitting around, not getting paid all that much. And you think, hey, I can hire all these college educated workers real cheap. So I really want to hire them. And so you're going to say, start a tech firm that can hire a lot of college educated workers. You're going to start mm, Apple or Microsoft, or you're going to expand the size of IBM. Suddenly those tech in those industries that can really hire a lot of college educated workers, they start to grow. And then suddenly that is going to make, you're basically allowing the, res, the demand response to happen a lot more strongly. If there weren't a lot of people around to hire those college educated workers, there's only so much that could change, but you give them time to respond. You give them time to take advantage of those low prices and they're going to do it. So over time, demand is going to get more elastic and we're going to redraw the same supply shift as before, but this time we're going to say that demand is a lot more elastic. The, the slope is a lot more shallow. And this is what it's going to look like over time. Now, over time, what this suggests is that in the long run, we would still see that increase in quantity. We would still see that decrease in price, but it would be a lot smaller of a decrease in price. So going from where we started, we started out with a very big price drop because we had an inelastic demand. And then as demand got a lot shallower, the price drop that we ended up with was still below where we started, but it was not as much of a drop. And so if we look at our graph, that's exactly what we see. We see this big drop and then we see that it sort of recovers a little bit as demand gets time to respond, as those industries get time to develop. Now we see that it actually didn't just rebound, it actually continued on and the, the wage premium went up and that would be the result of uh, more, more uh, of those industries opening, eventually demand shifting to the right. Uh, but that, that very first drop and that very first rebound can be explained by the fact that things get more elastic over time and when the price dropped, industries formed to absorb all those nice college educated workers that can be had for cheap. All right, that's all we have on elasticity. So things that I want you to remember, first of all, we have elasticity on both the demand and supply side. In both cases it is describing how big of a quantity response there will be to a price change. If it's very big response, that is elastic. If it is a very small response, that is inelastic. We can talk about relative elasticity. The steeper of a slope you have, the more inelastic that response is. And the more shallow of a slope you have, the more relatively elastic the response is. And for all those different slopes, we can calculate elasticity at a particular point on it. We can call that the point elasticity. And that point elasticity is going to be different depending on what price and quantity you're actually at. We can calculate that by looking at one divided by the slope times whatever the current price is divided by the current quantity. Give yourself a couple of practice questions on that is what I'd recommend. We also talked about what determines whether a good is going to have an inelastic or elastic supply and an inelastic or elastic demand. So different ways to think about on the demand side, how easy is it to stop buying this thing? And on the supply side, how flexible is our production process? All right, that is it. Uh, and I will see you next time. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye-bye.